management practices LinkedIn live event. Hello everyone and welcome to this LinkedIn live event around the value of assurance management practices. My name is Daniel Nichols and I'm going to be your host for today. Now, just before I launch in and introduce you to our steam guest today on our panel, we're, we're drawn people together from research, from the corporate world of project management, and also from APIs, assurance, uh, this is specific interest. Um, I'm actually going to give you a very quick overview about what today's session is going to cover. So firstly, we're going to hear from the research leads, Dr. Andrew Schuster and Sarah Coleman, about the findings of a recent APM research report, which looks at the value of assurance. Then, once we've heard from Andrew and Sarah about the key findings, why this research is relevant and useful to you and your organization, we're then going to have a bit of a panel discussion between our guests on this call, talking about some of the key issues arising from the research. And then finally, the third part of our conversation today is really about yourselves, is about the questions and answer session that you can bring to this. So we very much welcome interactivity with yourselves as the delegates. So as we go through the session, if you could please bear in mind any questions you have or burning comments that you want me to raise on your behalf, and I'll bring those up throughout the next 40 minutes or so. So again, before we kick on, I'd just like to introduce our panel members. So I've always already introduced myself, I'm Daniel Nichols, APM's Research Manager, but Andrew Schuster, could you uh, quickly tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, ever so briefly, uh, Dr. Andrew Schuster, I'm one of the co-researchers for this project. Uh, currently, I'm a partner at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and I'm a member of the Association for Project Management, um, Assurance SIG. Thank you, Andrew. And Sarah? So I'm Sarah Coleman. I'm also co-researcher and author for this. Um, I've also researched and authored other books and publications also. And I'm currently a full-time PhD student at Manchester University, um, looking at improving the delivery of major UK government projects. But my background originally was IT, but very much over the last 30 years has been projects, programs, portfolios. Thank you, Sarah. And Neil? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Neil Simpson uh, from BAE Systems. Uh, BAE Systems is a corporate partner of the APM, and um, we were um, a contributor with a case study into this research. Thank you very much, Neil. And Andrew Kay. Uh, my name is Andrew Krolikowski. Um, I'm an independent program project and portfolio management consultant, uh, and also uh, an ASIG volunteer and committee member. Uh, I'll talk about the ASIG. Uh, so that's the Assurance Special Interest Group uh, at the back end of, of this presentation, um, just to give you a, a feel for where within the APM uh, we have our community of practice. Um, so I'll talk about that later. But my background is an extensive background in, in, in uh, leading programs and projects and also in consultancy in the aero, nuclear, uh, clean energy and aerospace sectors. So thank you very much, everyone. And hopefully you've got a, a real flavor for those contributing to the panel today. So without further ado, let's hear a little bit more about this research, this value of assurance management practices that APM recently launched back in April. So Sarah, I don't know if you could take us through, what, what was this research? Why did APM undertake this? What were the key findings and maybe some of the re reflections and recommendations that people could apply in their day-to-day -day practices? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Daniel. So the, the question really is about why this research and quite rightly too. Uh, and I think two main points here. One is that from Andrew and my own background, uh, extensive backgrounds in, in project assurance in what uh, across various industry sectors, we wanted to understand how it's used in other organizations and environments we wanted to garner that wider view so we could actually um, help our own practices and, and those that we consult with. And the second area really around why this research is because in, in looking at this and looking at the literature, looking at the current research that is out there, there's very little around this particular focus in project studies compared certainly with other aspects of uh, project management domain literature, whether that is empirical research or anything else for that matter. So there's a lot out there around uh, leadership, stakeholder management, governance, risk control systems, but actually very little around that addresses this particular question. 
So the research had two key questions, which you, obviously you can see on the screen there. One is around the distinctive practices that uh, are out there and used to develop and deliver assurance management within organisations. Um, and secondly, how do organisations determine what kind of level, what kind of type of investment they're prepared to make in assurance management practices specifically around this. So what we really wanted to do um, was to get a, a wide range or a range of, of case studies so that in doing case studies, it actually helps other organizations to understand what insights, what experiences they've had and to help transfer some of that learning into their own organisations. So between us, Andrew and I, we invited five organisations across public services and the private sector, both in the UK and Canada. And the question is, why the UK and Canada? Well, it's really quite simple. I live in the UK and Andrew lives in Canada, hence why, hence that. So this is deliberate sampling, as you might um, uh, anticipate. But the organizations were targeted for very specific reasons. They had to be, they were selected on a range, on a base of a, a range of criteria here. So one of them was actually um, uh, planning and delivering port size of portfolio significant projects. They had to be people, they had to be organizations who were doing significant pieces of work here. Um, also organizations where project assurance was uh, deliberately introduced to support delivery and outcomes as well, quite notably. And then um, finally, of course, the, the most um, in anxious one is the availability and ease of access to interview interviewees within a um, quite a defined time period as well. So we had five organisations. Um, the first being Public Sector Employment and Social Development Canada, which is actually part of the Can Canadian Canadian federal government, excuse me there. Um, and the remaining four are global players of different uh, industry sectors. So S3 Group um, is, pro is about business staffing, Jacobs uh, Global Construction, BAE Systems Defence Manufacture, and Shell um, is uh, oil, gas, uh, and uh, clean energy. So between all of them, um, we were very interested in how they actually carried out this. And as I say, they're all very project-based organizations, very different approaches to assurance and how they actually deliver. They also had to have had interfaces um, connecting their project-based temporary organizations to their permanent functional parent organizations. Um, and our interviewees covered a range of project practitioners and other uh, associated professionals outside the immediate project the management community, but together this provided quite a diverse perspective on assurance management for it. So we were hoping with this research to be able to help the rest of the project community look at project assurance, think about it, think about what other organisations are doing in respect of assurance management um, and what aspects of practice they might be transferable to their own organisations and their own practice as well. So I'll take a real good canter through this particular piece of findings and I'm going to hand over to Andrew to, to discuss the rest. But one of the, um, the, the key findings um, that Andrew and I identified, um, as you can see on the left hand side, what traditional assurance looks like as, as compared to what we're calling nimble assurance. So traditional assurance very much around process. It's looking at uh, projects efficiency rather than necessarily effectiveness. It's very much a reaction to what has already happened. Uh, it's done to the project compliance after the fact and a single point in, in time. And what we've been trying to do is explain how that differs from what we're calling nimble assurance here, um, which really focuses on um, giving governance bodies and individuals, other individuals, alerting them to potential risks, uncertainty, based on expert judgment and experience. So this is about the rapid um, investigation of, of particular risk areas, uh, mitigating uncertainty, informing for decision making, particularly about current situation and mitigating circumstances and 
trying to provide um, provisional potential responses to the findings. So here, Nimble Assurance is very much what we call a service to governance. Um, and I think it's important because some of the conversations that we had were around governance drawing attention to assurance management specifically as a contributor to well-informed decision making on, on projects and where they were going to go. And I'm going to hand over Andrew for the next slide. Thank you, Sarah. And um, before I go into describe this, these findings, I want to tremendously thank the contributing organizations who and the individuals who gave us a lot of their time. And what was impressive is as learning organizations, they they were willing to give their time to, to this research. So just uh, on behalf of the, the researchers, thank you very much. Um, and I think when the lovely thing about doing research is we learn a lot as well. So on this journey, I'd like to share some of those 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 learnings. And while I want to I want to point out and Sarah's touched on this, but we very carefully chose some of our language in the report. And we describe this as assurance management and as a service that supports decision making. And the, one of the questions we've had you know, at the onset was what is the value of assurance man how do, how do you assess how much you, you the value has two two dimensions one is the cost side how much do you put in and what do you get out in terms of my deter you know what is that i i see is 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 important to me and am i getting enough from this assurance management service and one of the questions can you get a business case around you know that kind of concept and what we discovered is we have to come at this in a slightly different way and think about, OK, if it's an embedded part of program project management, you've got to look at it as a capability, a capacity, something that's embedded in the organization. And there's too many variables to decide to put a, one single answer down. So to come to how do you determine the value and how do you increase the value is we've come to the, the, the discovery that there's five dimensions, five things to think about. And if you can optimize these five things, you will increase the value and the impact of assurance management. So the five things that we've identified is governance. And I'm going to repeat a little bit. Sarah mentioned the assurance management there is, is in place to support decision making. So it must be tied to governance. How well is it tied to governance? And so that is a really important factor to consider, a dimension to consider when you're looking at the value of assurance management. And the other thing to think about in governance is in a smaller undertaking, the governance is quite tight. In larger undertakings, it separates. So if there's a, a macro, meso, and micro level of governance, and you have to think of how assurance supports each of those three levels. And uh, there's a little bit more in the report, so I'll sort of stop there. But think about governance, tie assurance to governance, and make sure the quality of the information and insights that you're providing governance are 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 the ma are maximized. The second thing is around methods. Now there are different techniques, and processes, and ways of approaching assurance, and they can be done. You know, some of the common things we hear, we're more familiar with gate reviews, or you can do lessons learned exercises, deep dives. And the one thing that we're promoting in this is something that's progressive. It it it, it evolves and it moves along with the needs of the decision makers and the methods you apply to that then need to reflect what it is that's required and that's a risk driven exercise. So understand your risk and apply assurance where it matters the most. Um, the third thing is integration. This is a little bit, usually, actually I'm gonna come back to integration. I'm gonna move to cadence. Uh, cadence then is how frequently do we actually um, have assurance related exercises and there are many assurance if you think that the macro meso and micro level of assurance there's many things happening but be planful in terms of how often you do these things they can be temporarily driven by time or they can be driven by events or activities and one of the things about values you can have too much assurance and so far as it's not coordinated and it puts huge demands on the delivery team so be mindful of providing the right amount and level and pace of assurance. So something to think about in terms of cadence. The fourth element then is specialism is 
uh, in some organizations and not necessarily the ones that we looked at, uh, they, they, they wanted to warn you about it's a specialism. It's something they actively built up capability, capacity, and focused energy around assurance rather than it's something that's just done on the side of someone's desk. Because if it's done on the side of someone's desk, they're not focused on the topic or don't have the, 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 the mental space. And so think about your people, the people dimension of assurance. Do you have uh, a program of, of learning, education, training, uh, uh, and, and the right skills of the individuals that are doing the, the, the assurance? And the thing that's important about assurance, it's about judgment and judgments built based on experience. So you need people that are experienced and who have an insight into the work that's being done and the assurance management processes. And the last fifth element then is integration. So integration, this is the tricky one where a lot of organizations, they, um, they we discovered that they're doing, but maybe didn't call it out in terms of thinking of it in this way. But assurance is connected horizontally and vertically in terms of how it operates. So when I say vertically, it's at the three levels of, of governance that I've mentioned earlier, but also it's connected to many other things. It's connected, you know, if you're doing assurance, it's connected to your risk management process, it's connected to benefits realization, it's connected to supply chain. So are those teams working together and understanding how the assurance processes couple with those other activities, those other management activities? And the, 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 the third part of the integration is there's assurance that happens within the program or project and the teams and the individuals that are doing assurance within that context, but there's also external integration. So you have to think about looking beyond the organize, the project based organization and how it connects up with the larger the larger context. And you can have many external bodies coming in for different reasons providing their level of assurance. So you've got to think quite broadly. So apologies for going quite quickly in terms of the, that, that detail. But those are some of the findings. So value then, in summary, comes from thinking about these five dimensions and getting it right. And you can have too much in some areas and not enough in others. So we, we have these sort of in our, um, we try to think about as practitioners, <clears throat> how can you actually take the research and employ it? So there's a table in the in the study which shows, you know, some of the questions you might put to yourself to maximize value and not have too much and have not too little, but have just right for your organization. So I'll stop there. And um, I think that's it's, um, the a little bit of a counter to the findings. And we'll explore some more of these ideas through some of the questions and answers. No, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing those findings. I think it's most intriguing. And, and I think when when you hear these kind of titles the value of assurance people often want to say well hey how do we actually underpin value and i think that's going to bring me on to one of the, the first questions i have is for the panel members but just just before we kind of enter that i just wanted to say thank you very much for everyone for engaging so far in the session uh through the chat function and with the kind of questions we really want to hear from you um yeah, so any questions you might have uh, we'll start to look at taking those next kind of 15 20 minutes but just a quick shout outs to everyone so far robert so uh, we've got Robert Shard, uh, people join us today from the Middle East, from uh, the US, the UK. So thank you very much everyone for your kind comments uh, so far and it's, it's great to hear from you today and have such a you know great and varied uh, audience um, participating and, and you know insurance is an important topic uh, which sometimes often unfortunately gets overlooked and this is one of the things we're going to you know very much hope to bring to light on this on this session today. So one of the first questions I really have is the title itself is about the value of assurance. And um, interestingly, I mean, one of the things I suppose I want to kind of pose to you as kind of panel members is why is assurance management important to you? Um, how is it important to your projects, to your organizations? What specific elements of assurance is important to you? And so we've heard so far from Sarah and Andrew. So Neil is one of the participate in organizations and BAE systems. I just wondered if maybe if you could share some insights from your own organizations and your own experience about why is insurance important to you and, and BAE systems? Yeah, sure, no worries. <clears throat> uh, um, you know, you can kind of answer the question quite glibly, which says, can you afford not to? Um, which is kind of reversing the question back around. Um, and I think, <clears throat> you know, in BAE systems, uh, we had um, a couple of disastrous projects that um, really forced us, 
I mean, it was 20 plus years ago or so, uh, about, about 20 years ago, where, where we had those disastrous programs. And that really forced us to hold the mirror up to ourselves and improve the way that we do assurance. Um, and, and of course, then you're back to, I mean, we're a huge company with lots of different um, domains, uh, lots of, of different complexity of program. And so you then ask yourself the question, well, can you can you have assurance where it's one size fits all? And of course, if you do that, your really, really complex programs uh, are under assured. Um, and and then equally, you're, you're sim if you go for, well, let's have one size fits all that um, that suits our complex programs, then you just kill yourself uh, with a lack of efficiency uh, and effectiveness um, on your smaller and simpler programs. So it's a real uh, a real kind of conundrum uh, that um, you have to set yourself through your governance um, with at what level of complexity do you um, apply a level of assurance, um, scale that against if the project goes wrong, um, how much is that going to damage you, whether that's a financial uh, perspective or whether it's a reputational perspective, uh, for example. Um, and from that, uh, you can then start designing your um, your assurance proce uh, process, methodology, approach, strategy um, that suits your business and and your projects. Um, uh, I don't know. Does that? Yeah, no, I think very much so, Neil. Very much so, and I, I can see that in the, in the chat function there from one of the delegates from Shalina. She said she very much appreciate your honesty. That quite often we learn a lot from failures and issues that are kind of cropped up in projects, and that's one of the best ways that we can kind of move forward and, and enhance our knowledge in the, in the future. So I think that's really insightful, and it's really good to kind of get an organisational perspective because sometimes we we kind of look at the research, but then sometimes think, well, how does that play out in reality and practice? So, Andrew Kay, I don't know if you could likewise add to some of the same questions from your own perspective. Sure, uh, just just to add to to Neil's perspective, yeah, yeah, it's all come from project failures. You you learn from that, and uh, and I too, uh, having formerly been a, a member of BA Systems when you're involved in aircraft development you, you you find certain things aren't quite as well um as they should be when you've used the money you've spent the time and you're at the end point but the plane's still not flying um so, so you go on a on a journey and you, you've then got to figure out well what 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 do you need to do on top of ordinary delivery project and program management to to see what you need to see to make effective decisions and it's really useful in this research paper that, that, that Andrew and, and Sarah brought out the, uh, uh, an aggregated definition of assurance where it's about transparency and confidence in project and program delivery. Um, but it needs to go a little bit further than that. It's, it's transparency and confidence to aid effective early decision making. So yeah. leaders and sponsors have got to make decisions early in the project life cycle. And I can't emphasize enough on how dragging back those decision points on a progressive basis early in the life cycle can really influence the end result. Um, and, and that's the, the, the beauty of why it's so important. It's to be able to uh, make those decisions early and make sure you can see them through and capture and learn from those decisions in parallel with, with the delivery of the project. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up as well. Again, um, feels like a game of tennis, but um, we, um, I think, you know, we talk about, look in the research paper, we talks about three lines of defense. And so again, you kind of look for, for, for each of those communities, what's the value for each of those communities. So clearly we, you know, we're talking about the, 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 um, the project level. Um, you know, it, it's about helping the project team understand um the risk the uncertainty that they have at, at that moment in time um they you know you're taking the next level up and you start looking at who your functional specialists are and so forth and again it's about how do you bring in that uh, level of of lfe from other areas um so again you're helping the project team and the next level which i guess is your your um your um, your corporation, your enterprise, your stakeholders. Um, how, again, you know, what level of risk is the project holding to the business? 
Um, uh, and and again, it's about about not only understanding the risks to the project, but understanding the risks to the business. And so that gives the, the organization early insights. If you're doing assurance properly, and it's in conjunction with the with the project team, rather than it being done to the project team, then that's helping the project team understand. Now, quite often you find with project teams, they can't see the, the wood for the trees. And so, or, or the project is degrading, its performance is worsening, and they don't want to admit to it. So again, having some form of level of independence uh, uh, to your assurance, uh, it allows the project team to be, you know, given a good shake up and, and woken up to the, the problems. But, but also it gives you major stakeholders um, more confidence um, that the project status is correct because there's been a level of independence to it. No, thank you very much, Neil. Thanks, Andrew Kay, as well. They're really insightful views. And actually, I, I wanted to kind of bring in Andrew S, actually, because as well as being the research lead for this paper, um, you're also director of assurance at PwC. So I don't know if you have any, any points to add on this question at all. Well, I'm going to I'm going to focus on the, the research and the findings themselves. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight, I guess, and maybe and I'm going to pick up on on the points that Andrew Kay and, and Neil were touching on is the, th the thing about it, uh, uh, assurance. And, and if you want to add confidence, you, you need to be forward looking. And we put that in the definition of, of nimble assurance. So how do you do that? How do you make it predictive? Well, the thing that's really important is you think of it as a as a management system which has good information, good analysis, and you're looking at this over time, which is where the idea of progressive comes in. And we discovered the organizations were looking at that started building that up as, as a formal established capability. We're better able to look forward. What's going to come? Uh, you know, we've we've seen the trends, and and the thing that we could expect next is X and Y. We've got some evidence of that, and then we can have an informed conversation. And the thing about programs and projects, they're risky. Risky means uncertain. So how do we actually add information into that conversation? Is is for systematizing assurance management and putting in place a capability which can inform. Uh, the the, um, the decision makers and that's how you make it predictive and you start adding tools that allow you to take the information you have and say what do we expect next and that's when it starts getting interesting the, the, the nuance here though is it can't be done as ad hoc you can't just start okay we'll grab some people at the side of their desk or we'll do a one-off or you know we'll just kind of throw some people at it and see what comes out the back end it's got to be thought about as all the other other kinds of services that you put in place the ones that we're more familiar with probably and put more attention around risk management being a good example it's, uh, this is another area where we focus so i don't know if that that that's something i think that was quite important and maybe we didn't cover in our our, our, our discussions but it was hinted at in the uh, by the panel so no, thanks for bringing that up, Andrew. I think that's really useful. And I can see already that a number of yourselves as delegates have started to bring in questions. That's really positive to see. And we, we start to come to some of these in a few moments' time. But again, if you've got any burning questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. So please uh, come forward with those. Now, one question I do have before we kind of enter the q and and I'm going to throw this to you, Sarah, as kind of one of the, the research leads, is how can assurance management be successfully introduced into the project delivery everyday environment is there any kind of key tips or thoughts around that and maybe maybe arising from the research or from indeed your own experience i think there are a number of dimensions to that question actually uh, daniel and i think um a good start of the 10 i would suggest because when we were doing the research these these were mature um organizations been using project management for a very long time and understood the value of uh, assurance and having had some of those conversations with them about what were the challenges, what were the mindsets around this, um, and how many, if you like, battles did you have to fight before actually this this became um, something that was, as Andrew says, was quite systematized within within the organization as well. So, um, and I think starting out, if you're looking to 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 start this and um, deliver something from scratch from a, a blank sheet of paper, then the first conversations are possibly around what are you trying to achieve with it? What is it trying to do for you? Is it about decision making? Is it about early predictive warning uh, warning signs? It is, is it between the, um, about uh, mitigating risk? 
Um, for example, um, I've spent several years now as a GMPP reviewer. And for those who, who don't know the GMPP, it's the, the UK government major projects portfolio. Uh, these are um, thousands of billions of pounds worth of projects. Um, and a lot of their, uh, their assurance reviews, for example, are based on actual benefits um, slightly different from the public sector, uh, from sorry, from the private sector, because this is about advantages and impact, policy impact in evaluation to to citizens. So the the the, um, the focus is slightly different. And I bring this up because um, it depends on what you're trying to actually achieve with this. So the question is, at a strategic level, what are you actually trying to achieve with it? And, and then what is good for you? So, that, so Neil certainly talked about um, what is proportionate for your organization. Um, three levels of defense we, we are quite normalized now within organizations and, and the, the assurance community. Um, the first level is, is the very local level, and then you can build up. So for example, the, the major infrastructure projects um, have what they call P rep teams, project representative teams that dive in and out are actually there on the ground on site day in day out with the with the um, with with the project team, the project delivery team, and they are a lot of the early warning systems. So, do you need that, or do you need something more customized? So, I think there are a lot of different dimensions to to the, that question, Daniel. It's a great question, um, and the, the 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 focus is around what you're trying to achieve. And what do you have to play with and whether you think that this is relevant to actually start to build your capability in this area or in in house or actually get uh, some external advice around that as well. No, thank you very much, Sarah. I think that's really insightful and helpful for people to think about, you know, what, what do I need to consider going forward? And I don't know if any other panel members have got any comments they wish to add to that before we start to, to take questions from the panels. Andrew Kay. Yeah. Um... In, in the nuts and bolts of, of, of setting out a project or a program, it's really important to consider assurance as something you need to do. Uh, and I'll wander into the territory of uh, the government's Green Book business case um, guidance. Uh, so UK government uh, has a Green Book and it sets out a number of cases. Now, there's one really, really important case that is very overlooked, and that's the management case. That case needs to set out what you do who you do it with and how you will deliver that project in a way that the business case sets out. So in the public sector, the UK public sector, assurance is all about ensuring that the delivery of the project is consistent with the way the business case sets it out. So the best time to frame the scope in the way that Sarah has described and, and the way that the, pa the paper describes assurance is, is to set out your justification in the business case get it appraised and evaluated at the beginning and make sure it's progressively delivered throughout. The worst thing that you can do is try and bolt it on when there's a problem or there's a there's a finding at a key review gate because you're not going to extract the value back out. And that's the best time at which you can then set your parameters, set your metrics, understand how you're going to collect data and how you're going to learn from this and how you can have progressive and forward-looking assurance. So for me, there's more guidance that perhaps might need to be structured to aid um, the PM community in how to go about justifying and setting out assurance right from the inception of a project. But that's the place to properly tackle the subject. No, thank you, Andrew. I think that's a really important point there around you know, getting it right from the outset. And often sometimes that's a, sometimes we kind of dive into projects without actually you know getting everything right at the front end. So it's a really, really good point there for, for our delegates to hear. Now we're going to start to, to take some questions from yourselves as, as delegates. So again, as I kind of start to field these to members of our panel, please feel free to kind of add to them because we'd love to hear from you. And again, it's really positive to hear all your kind of comments that you've given the feedback so far. So again, love to hear from you as the session progresses. So the, the first question that we've got for yourselves as panel members today comes from Shalina Somali, who asks, how can project program managers reinforce the need for assurance to be planned in from the outset? Do you have any top tips? So I'm going to pick people at random. So Andrew S, do you have any? 
<laughs> yeah, I think part of the, the key there is, is, as we've touched on already, is to build it into your planning processes from the onset and to think about what the level of assurance or type of assurance that you're going to require. And the thing that's important that we, we maybe not touched on, and um, I saw in some of the comments that assurance can start looking a little bit like some of the other uh, things that we do in program project, like risk management, which is absolutely true. One of the distinguishing fe features of assurance management, though, is it's objective or independent. And um, it, it kind of relates to another comment that I've seen as well is, you know, how, how do you um, make sure that to, um, uh, uh, you, 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 you don't go native, I guess, with, with assurance management and that's, you, it's, it's think about how you make it uh, uh, somewhere that you're providing, uh, you're not doing self review, you're not reviewing your own work. You have to have someone else that comes in because what we, we we all have biases. We all lose our objectivity. We want the, the we you know at the front end of programs and projects we want to get the funding. So we play down the costs. We play up the value to get the funding because we want it. You know we want to do a great job. But, but this is a bias and this happens repeatedly and there's lots of research around that. And then when you get the funding, the reverse happens. <laughs> You start realizing that you've underestimated the cost and overestimated the value and how do we get ourselves out of that and assurance can play play a role in that so how do you how do you build it in is first of all plan for it uh, make sure that you've got some some specialists that understand how the methods and tools and techniques actually operate and then th keep in mind that it's it's um, we all, when you're involved in the program, we all want to be successful. So, so talk to one another, work collaboratively, uh, try not treat it as, as some, some enemy of the state. It, it's, it's meant to be helpful. And if it's designed and implemented, it, you will find that it's easier to introduce and, and, and support uh, because it's treated as something that's an enabler rather than something that's um, a limiter of, of success. So some thoughts out of that helps and I'll turn over to others. Yes, Sarah, I think you, you wanted to come in on that. I, I did. I, I, I would like to, to comment on that because I'm, I'm just looking through the comments at the moment and how can you reinforce the need for assurance. Um, and picking up on Andrew's point, um, looking at it objectively, and I've had this conversation a lot with different organisations, um, the, the immediate response to assurance is it's, it's an additional cost an additional bureaucracy required um, and the the very facile response um, that I think Andrew you were alluding to and Neil you were alluding to earlier is well what is the cost of failure um, so when UK government does a GMPP they, they talk about uh, DCAs, which is basically confidence ratings. How confident are you this project is going to achieve what you're setting out to achieve? Um, but I think I was really taken um, by the conversations during the research about using it as a development tool for project community, because um, most organisations use their own project community to assure other projects within portfolio within the organisation. Um, and this produces a huge amount of learning on both sides. Um, I, there is a, um, a quote which I really wanted in the research, which Andrew very kindly agreed to, which is basically um, that assurance is not for the assurers, it's for the assured. Um, and if you don't have that feedback loop within the organisation for learning and to for continuous improvement, then actually you've lost a huge opportunity here. So I think I would respond in two ways. One is actually it's part of development opportunities for project community themselves. Um, and number two, it's, it's really about giving, um, go, uh, sorry, I was gonna say government, but giving organizations, giving the executive, the senior executive, the, the board level members, confidence about the ability to, to actually deliver what you say you're going to deliver. No, some really good points raised there, Sarah, and I think you actually helped to answer a couple of questions that some of our delegates had, and there were Annie had asked questions about the risks involved, and you've started to touch on those, and, and, and I know there's similar kind of comments felt through um, other delegates based on their comments so far. 
Now, I've got another interesting question, which touches a little bit on what yourself and Andrew are talking about, and I'd love to kind of get Neil's kind of views on this. And this is a, a question here from Sonia Sharma, who asks, how do you ensure that assurance process is not seen as policing? And what's the best way to encourage PMs to be open and honest about the status and issues? Do you have any thoughts around that, Neil? Whew, yeah, so, I mean, fundamentally, it's not policing because all your assurance activities should be outcome focused how do we make sure that the project is going to deliver what the project is designed to deliver um if you start talking about policing um then you know you you start kind of asking the question about compliance and that is are you following the processes and whilst there is value in that in some ways just because you follow the process doesn't guarantee your project success so so i think you know all assurance activity needs to be outcome focused um and not to worry too much about, about compliance um so then the second part of the question is about honesty and transparency and and I think it's a behavior and cultural thing. So uh, again, if you are being assured and, and interviewed and, you know, the, put under the microscope by your peers, then, then that should be, you know, uh, uh, you know, try and take the mindset of, wowee, I'm getting some free consultancy. Um, again, you know, if you are as a project manager looking for, somebody to come and uh, run the rule over you um, then you know ask yourself who is it that you want to perform that assurance activity which is what andrew k was was talking about when you when you you know design design your project on day one one of the big questions is how are you going to assure yourself and part of that question is and who's going to assure you um because again take the mindset of who can I go and get some free consultancy from? Because, you know, um, BA systems, you know, uh, we build ships and we build airplanes. So if I'm a, if I'm a project manager on, on, on building a ship, do I really want somebody who's been um, building airplanes all their life to come and come and look at what I'm doing? It would be interesting. I'm sure they'll have different views, uh, but equally, if they're going to be and, and this is where we, we're talking about earlier about predictive rather than reactive. If somebody's been there, had the scars, seen it, done it all before, the chances are that they'll be able to predict your future problems more so than just spot the reactive ones like you. So again, um, making sure you get the right choice of team to run the assurance activities on you is fundamental to um to to its success no that's a really good point Neil, and, and that actually chimes very much with another piece of recent research which they call dynamic conditions for success which is about building that project team the importance of that team dynamic and ensuring project success so again very much ties in with our very current research it's great to hear and, and there's some really interesting conversations actually being had in the chat from Marcel from Jamie from Bruce from Shalina and others and I've got a question here I'd like to pose to Andrew Kay actually and it's from an anonymous user so I, unfortunately I don't know your name so I can't get that background but what they say is many less mature and even some mature businesses do not see the correlation between assurance and delivery success and all too often it's dismissed as a cost overhead There's, that often the C-suite may well be added or overlooked due to a lack of understanding and project representation of these kind of forums at this senior level. How would we mitigate other than more project professionals at board level? Is there things that, that we can do as a kind of profession, do you think, to kind of start to, to think about that? Do you think, how can we reach people at the C-suite and, and considering assurance as a, a key aspect on, on kind of major projects and programs? Yeah, um, I, I think what the um, project and program leadership community, the portfolio community and the C-suite tend to have much of these days is um, quite a lot of effective project controls, um, which, which give nice tangible indicators of what's happening. Um, what I'm going to suggest is assurance is a, bright, a, a, a much broader landscape than that. 
Um, we mentioned earlier in the discussion, it's about the integration of the organization across all the levels, both laterally against the collaborations, the supply chain, but also vertically through, through the leadership chains. Uh, and it, so it needs to look at aspects of the organization and all of the other functional competencies that get brought in. Um, so it, that there are other things that are, are worth looking at that the assurance community can, can um, table. Uh, matters of... Uh, maturity. Um, we, we're familiar with um, the program um, portfolio and project management maturity model, uh, CMMI models, things like that, that look at the maturity aspects and they give different perspectives um, than just project controls. Um, we must also remember that at the end of the day, there's a product or a service or a platform that pops out of this. So we've got to look at readiness and how to look at readiness. So what where i'm suggesting is is assurance um to avoid it conflicting with what the project management community and the project controls community would traditionally present it augments that to a broader um pan enterprise and pan organizational sort of set of information that really gives some clarity to the to the, to the health a barometer for the, for the for the state of health of a project or a program uh, and that is a different perspective that a, 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 an informed assurance community can have. I, I don't know if I've completely unpicked the nature of the question, but, but where I wanted to go is, is to make sure that the assurance was more expansive than just looking at the particulars of projects and programmes themselves. It needs to be the context and the environments that the projects are delivered in. And that's where assurance adds that sort of virtual value. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point, Andrew. And and I think also one of and it kind of builds me up to actually one of the things I just wanted to quickly say is that we're approaching towards the end of the time of our session now, and it's it's crazy how the time flies. And I'm sure the panel members could agree that it's you know for forty five minutes that seems like quite a lot of time, and and suddenly it's almost away with us. But what we want to say is if you do have questions and we haven't been able to answer them today, we will try and answer those for you and then come back to you in, in due course. And um, there are many ways that you can engage with this work going forward. So uh, you can read the research report that we've referred to in more detail. So you can, you know, Andrew and Sarah shared uh, an overview of the research, but you might want to kind of cover that in more detail. And we'll put that into the chat so you can look at that and, and kind of interact with that. And I'm sure we're we'll kind of run other sessions going forward. And one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about and, and pass over to Andrew Kay is really talking a little bit about the assurance specific interest group that we have at APM. We're going to take forward some of this work. And you probably asked that question of, well, who are the assurance specific interest groups? So I think it's a really good time to, to pass over to Andrew to tell us a little bit more about it and, and how they can help some of the delegates on the call. Because I'm sure they, they'd love to know more and how they can get involved. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. Uh, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the uh, the authors of the report, which I felt was an absolutely fantastic addition to the quite sparse body of knowledge on the finer points of assurance management in project management. Um, it, 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 it does chime in a number of different corners. Uh, and within the APM, um, there's, uh, there's a good tradition of volunteer support. And part of that is um, the regional groups, but also the special interest groups. And one of those special interest groups is the assurance special interest groups, of which I'm a member uh, and, and Andrew is, I, I know. Um, so so what, what do we do? We, we are the community of practice within the APM that look at all manners and matters to do with uh, assurance. Um, and within the committee, we have um, our strategy going forward. But that focuses on how we're going to develop the profession. But it'd be useful just to um, talk about what we're doing and what's coming up and how to get involved and engaged. Um, we number about 2,000 or so subscribers through the APM website that, that have been ticked to support the assurance community and get um, the, the newsletters and such like. And we also have a number of about 40 to 50 active volunteers, of which a number of us are in the committee. But what we do is, is we um, publish best practice, hold events uh, and have various engagement and volunteering opportunities. So just to skip through some of those forthcoming ones, we, we hold much monthly virtual networking events, very well supported, an hour long session where we talk about some interesting themes uh, and we have up to 100 people on those calls, uh, much similar to this one, but uh, on, on a whole range of different subjects uh, around uh, assurance. 
We've talked about forward-looking assurance, nimble and progressive assurance. Those are buzzwords that have come out of the talk today. I'm happy to say that our forthcoming co uh, conference in the autumn, together with the systems thinking community, is going to feature a session on forward-looking assurance. So there's an opportunity to participate in that and, 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 and help create and support that. Um, we author best practice. So um, touching on this particular subject, um, there's the guide to integrated for integrated assurance, which talks about how to plan for integrated assurance and the defense, the lines of de the defense, the three lines of defense we talked about. We also have a guide to agile delivery. We, we live in a very agile world these days. There are other ways of delivering than waterfall. So agile is talked about in insurance terms. There's a guide for that published. Um, we have a recently published document called uh, Measures for Project Assurance. So that's a toolkit produced by, by our community, which give a view of how to uh, put effective measures in place against 10 criteria, which are pan project management discipline. They cover all of the functional competencies and capabilities within project management that typically fit within any organization. What I really wanted to highlight, though, is the forthcoming publication, and it's available now to download from the internet, uh, from the APM website, which is the Guide for Project Auditing. So that talks about how to go through, and, and Neil mentioned before about, well, OK, there's adherence to process. We can't forget that that's quality and auditing is still a very important element of ensuring that we are adhering to what we said we would do. And we're doing it in the style in which we said we would do it. Uh, so we have a guide for project auditing, which has just been published. Um, we do update these documents. And the next document that's going to be refreshed is the guide for integrated assurance. And I'm sure some of the themes from this particular research will meander into the thinking that will cover that particular document. So um, I'm, I'm casting the net to see who would like to volunteer and, and reach out to us. Uh, you can access the um, APM SIG, uh, the Assurance SIG through the APM website. Uh, when the um, uh, presentation material comes on the live, I'll make sure that the, uh, the, the, the web links are there. We'd like to understand uh, who would like to volunteer and contribute and um, participate into our broader roadmap. We, we, we are looking to make sure that the APM is the go-to place for the assurance professionals uh, and to make sure that the competencies, the capabilities, the skills, the tools, the methodologies needed for assurance are properly presented in an agnostic way that we can then put across to the broader community, whichever sector um, we are conducting project assurance. Um, so we're, we're a ve very active assurance community and we'd like to like to hear from you. No, thank you very much, Andrew. And I think it's great to hear about that kind of wealth of expertise that you have and resources, because often people don't all know about that. And I know that people have asked on this call today, uh, you know, in terms of you, you followed up on some of the questions that people had about how do you measure assurance? So it's great to know that you've already thought of that. You've kind of been there and done that. So again, please do refer to these resources and we will add the link to the Assurance SIG um, in the kind of live chat as this goes live and when we put this on YouTube. Um, and I just want to say, just before I kind of thank everyone for their time today, thank you very much for yourselves as delegates today. Now, uh, this resource will be turned into a YouTube video. So if you want to watch it back at any point or if you want to indeed share it with colleagues or friends, please feel free to do so. And we'll share this with you uh, once that's available. It usually takes about a week or so to do, but um, once it's ready, we'll share that with you. So again, I just want to thank yourselves, the delegates, for all your questions, your comments, your feedback. We look forward to kind of hearing from you in future LinkedIn live events. And hopefully we might do another kind of research one around AI. But today I just wanted to thank the uh, research leads, Andrew and Sarah, and our panel members, Andrew Kay and, and Neil Simpson as well uh, from BAE who have shared real passionate insights and I think they've started to bring the the topic and the research to life so again thank you very much all and thank you for your time today and hope to see you in the future APM LinkedIn lives so thank you thank you, thank you very much thank Bye. you everyone <laughs> bye bye, bye, -bye.